Hey everybody, this is Mr. Mop coming at you with part three of the APUSH Topic 3.3 series focusing in on taxation with representation. Hopefully this is the last part uh, of this topic. We'll see if we can get it in within 15 minutes. Uh, now, when we were here together previously, we were talking about how there had been a slew of, of policies throughout the 1760s that were designed to try to raise revenue for Parliament to try to pay off the immense debts from the French Indian War, uh, but were you know found to be you know pretty much unacceptable by the colonists due to the fact that these were policies made without any kind of colonial official representation there. Uh, hence the uh, hence the famous phrase taxation without representation. And you know so far we've seen that these policies have not just been unpopular but really ineffective for. Parliament. Uh, the Stamp Act was so despised that it didn't even last a year, and the uh, Townsend Acts had also proven to be pretty ineffective. Uh, but nonetheless, Parliament doesn't learn the lesson that maybe they should stop taxing the colonies without permission, but decide to you know double down. In other words, to become even you know stronger in their attempts to try to control what's going on with the colonies, and they just would not abide to this idea of protest by. The colonists, they, you know, they were the mother colony. The colonies were, in essence, the children, and they were not going to let the children dictate what the parent was going to do in terms of parenting. Um, so as we see more and more British soldiers making their way to the colonies to try to have more and more of a, a tighter grip on what's happening there, uh, we see more and more of these colonial leaders trying to come together to see if, you know, the sentiment in Massachusetts was the same as the sentiment in Virginia, you know, was the, the same in New York as it was in South Carolina. The idea of, you know, let's let's write together and see, you know, do we have the same issues? Are there same transgressions happening in different places, et cetera, et cetera. And this became what we call the, the committees of correspondence, you know, basically a letter writing campaign that is going to be critical in unifying these colonies. And it does reveal that, yeah, you know, the sentiment in Virginia was pretty similar to the sentiment in South Carolina, which was pretty similar to what was in Massachusetts. And they all believed that they were facing tyranny. They all believed that their rights were being targeted. Now, don't take this to mean just yet, though, that anybody's actually saying the word revolution yet. Nobody's saying that yet. But there is a common belief amongst these colonial leaders that rights have been violated. And what they want is Britain to protect those rights to not violate them, to bring them into the fold in terms of truly having a voice in these policies that are directly affecting them. But alas, Parliament it will not budge on this matter. Now, raising the temperature even further will be the incident taking place uh, off the coast of Newport, Rhode Island, and that is going to be the Gatsby incident, as you see uh, depicted here in this painting. Basically, the Gatsby was a British ship that was responsible for strictly enforcing the Navigation Acts. So basically what it did is it went after smuggling ships and things like that. Well, in one of these attempts to try to catch a, a smuggler's ship, it ran aground, once again, off the coast of Newport, Rhode Island. And when it did, local colonists uh, did not exactly help uh, that ship. Uh, they didn't try to, you know, try to get it back out to sea, but rather they set it on fire. Uh, as an act of defiance, saying that they will not tolerate uh, the crown's presence in their attempts to try to, you know, squash their liberty as they perceived it. They perceived this as a patriotic act. Now, imagine if you're Parliament, I think you're going to think this is a terrorist act. Uh, so, you know, obviously perspective uh, and interpretation are very significant. But what this does is raise the temperature even more, even sending an even louder message to Parliament that you've got to be stronger, you've got to be tougher and putting the clamp on these colonists, put the kibosh on this sense that they can kind of use terrorist tactics, be it the Sons of Liberty, be it what we see here at the Gatsby incident, to try to dictate what Parliament does. And so what this does is bring even more redcoats into the colonies, particularly in New England, where you know we see the sentiment of patriotism, you know, the anti-Parliament uh, sentiment, uh, be the strongest. And, you know, if, if England viewed... Uh, the colonies as children, as if it had 13 children, uh, clearly amongst these children, the problem child was Massachusetts. Uh, this is where patriot sentiment was the strongest. Uh, this is where, you know, uh, hatred of British colonies policies was, was strongest, where there was a, the strongest sentiment that their rights were being violated. And it's probably not going to be a surprise 
that Boston will be the center of the uh, fight against what is going to be the Tea Act. Now, the Tea Act uh, is going to be infamous in its attempt to try to, in many respects, put principle over money. You know, the idea being is that, you know, from the, uh, from the, you know, the, the patriotic American perspective, that it was about principle. It wasn't about money. Patriots aren't afraid to pay taxes, but they can, you know, they can only stomach paying taxes in, in, uh, after they've had a voice in, in the process. So Parliament says, okay, well, we're going to see if this is really about principles or if this is really about money. And so when the T Act is created, it creates this monopoly that the, uh, the London company has on selling tea in the colonies. And that tea is extremely cheap. Now, the note, they put a tax on that tea really in many respects as, as a, a form of trying to force obedience amongst the colonists. With the idea being is if these colonists are rational people and they buy things that are cheapest, assuming quality is the same, they will buy this tax tea and that they will have to, you know, uh, you know, question their principles to buy that tea. But they're confident that they will buy that tea and prove that it's not about principles for the patriots, for the colonists, but really it is about money at the end of the day. Uh, but Parliament's going to be wrong. Uh, when there's an attempt to unload this cheap tea uh, that is taxed in Boston, we're going to be seeing local members of the Sons of Liberty dressing up as uh, natives and basically storming this... Uh, this boat, whoops, not that right there, but uh, storming the boat and taking the tea and, well, as you can see here depicted, throwing it right in the harbor. Uh, in essence, basically turning uh, Boston Harbor into one big salty cup of tea. Uh, this is the most defiant act of the colonists thus far. I mean, you're talking about what would be in today's money, thousands and thousands of dollars of tea that are just straight up destroyed by locals. And once again, you know, if you're parliament, you're looking at this as, you know, things have become clearly lawless in Massachusetts, that this is terrorism. This is down, downright insubordination, maybe even treason in terms of what they are doing in their defiance. And as far as parliament was concerned, this was it. This was the last straw. Parliament had had it with Massachusetts, and they were going to teach Massachusetts a lesson a lesson that they would never forget, and in the process send a message to the other colonies uh, in case they were thinking they were going to do something cute like the Boston Tea Party. And that's going to be, of course, the Coercive Acts. The Coercive Acts were an attempt to uh, basically, you know, throttle Massachusetts, lock down authority, and once again send a message to the other colonies that they will not tolerate a, a an insubordinate set of colonies. Uh, now, these policies are going to include the Port Act, which is going to shut down Boston Harbor until all of that uh, money is paid uh, for the repair of uh, the, the, the repaying the cost of the tea that was dumped in the harbor. So in other words, they're going to shut down Boston economically until they get paid back. Politically, they're going to basically you know shut down the Massachusetts legislature, in essence. Uh, the royal governor is going to have much broader authority, which is appointed by par appointed by the crown. And so basically, if you are uh, somebody in Massachusetts, you believe that you have now been stripped of anything resembling economic rights, and now you've had anything resembling political rights stripped away from you as well. So, you know, these are two big major blows to what you consider to be your liberty. In addition... Even more crimes are now going to be uh, tried in Britain. And note, okay, that uh, this is now going to be uh, royal officials. Uh, now, what we mean by this is that, you know, in the past, you know, if you were a royal official and you were accused of a crime in, say, Massachusetts, then a Massachusetts court would determine guilt or innocence. Well, now the Crown is saying, no, 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 or at least Parliament is saying, no, 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 no. Those royal officials can only be tried in royal courts back in London, which, as you can imagine, you know, if there's a sense that the colonists are accusing the Crown's, uh, you know, representative with a crime, they're not going to believe the colonists particularly, and most likely they're going to get acquitted. So once again, there's a sense that there's no real justice. You know, the same Parliament that is now making colonists who are charged with, with violating 
uh, the Navigation Acts now have to s travel to London to almost certainly be convicted is now going the other way and now protecting these royal officials through their own courts. In other words, there's two different codes of justice, and once again, colonials are getting the short end of the stick. Additionally, there's going to be an expansion of the Quartering Act, going beyond just normal farms to now urban areas, uh, you know, properties that may not have been used, per se, by business owners, but now are going to be areas that are going to be targeted for quartering of troops at the expense of these, you know, business owners, you know, people that own warehouses, stuff like that. Uh, so these laws collectively were clearly punitive in nature, clearly designed to inflict punishment on Massachusetts and send a message to other colonies. And that's why these are going to be collectively called the Intolerable Acts. That by 1774, Parliament was now passing laws that were clearly designed to take away our freedom, clearly designed to take away our liberty, and clearly designed to, you know, inflict tyranny. So that's where we get that nickname for these collective laws. But at the same time that we also see the Coercive Acts being implemented, we see something else that maybe is even scarier long term in terms of what the future might look like for the colonies, and that is going to be the Quebec Act. Now, you may remember that from the French Indian War, Britain's territorial conquests had now been extended all the way out to the Mississippi River. But as you hopefully also recall, that that same year we see the Proclamation Line of 1763 be created that basically forbade colonists settling west of the Appalachians in an attempt to try to pacify the natives of the Great Lakes region. Now, for many colonists, this proclamation line was ignored, and those that even followed it believed that this was only going to be temporary in nature. But the Quebec Act is going to change all that. What Parliament decides to do is take what was the, the area of French Quebec, which was you know taken in the French Indian War right up through here, uh, an area that obviously was mostly ethnically French and heavily Catholic religiously, and what Parliament decides to do is extend those borders all the way into what is going to become uh, the American Northwest, or at least the, the Northwest of the 1780s, eventually. Basically, the Great Lakes region. And by doing so, this is going to create a tighter boundary to lock out British colonists from being able to travel there. They will establish Catholicism as the protected faith of this area, it's clearly counter to what colonists would support uh, you know, along the coast, and they will also set up a parliamentary system there that will be made up of crown-appointed officials, not chosen by local residents. What that does is send a shiver down the spines of colonists along the coast because if they can make you know, decisions to basically wipe out representative democracy here in the Great Lakes region, what's to stop them from doing it in the 13 colonies? So this was seen as a really scary thing for the future. It was, it was seen as a... Uh, you know, a betrayal in terms of what should happen to that territory given the French Indian War. And on top of that, it was seen as very scary moving forward for the potential uh, political rights of the colonists. So clearly, as we get into the mid-1770s, the, the, the temperature is reaching a boiling point. Uh, we're not really talking revolution yet, although we're getting closer. Uh, we're not talking about it yet, but we are seeing the temperature rising. And as that temperature rises, it also clearly creates divides, not just between the colonists and Britain, but even amongst the colonists themselves. Don't think that this Patriot movement was a monolithic thing, or that the vast majority of residents were strong, outspoken, uh, you know, uh, patriots. Uh, that was true in places like New England, and for many rural Americans, uh, you know, poor Americans tended to be part of this Patriot cause. But for many wealthy merchants in the, the central colonies and the southern colonies, uh, places like New York, Philadelphia, Charleston, we didn't quite see that as much. There was much more of a sense of loyalty to the British crown uh, than, you know, uh, you know, resistance to the crown. So understand that, that this is not a uniform thing. And this is going to continue to be a little bit of a divisive issue, really all the way through the Revolutionary War era as we go through it. So anyhow, that brings us to the mid-1770s. We are on the cusp of revolution, but we still got a few more events to have happen before we actually declare that independence. So uh, until next time, I will see you later. Bye-bye.